Okay, it looks like we are at the top of the hour now. So hello everyone, my name is Lindsay Montanari. I lead the academic program for Groby Optimization. Thanks so much for joining us today for this webinar, Gamifying Optimization Education with the Burrito Optimization Game. Before we dive in, I just wanted to hit a few logistics points. So if you have a question at any point throughout today's webinar, don't hesitate to ask it. Please use the Q&A feature of Zoom. I'm gonna to try to answer questions about the game throughout the entire presentation, but we're gonna save 10 minutes at the end of the presentation as well for a quick live Q&A with Larry. Today's webinar is the fourth of a new series in 2022, shining the spotlight on the academic community and its innovative approaches to problem solving. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Larry Snyder. Larry is the Harvey E. Wagner Endowed Chair in Manufacturing Systems Engineering in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department and the Director of the Institute for Data, Intelligence Systems, and Computation at Lehigh University. He received his PhD in Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences from Northwestern University, and his research interests include modeling and solving problems in supply chain management and energy systems, particularly when the problem exhibits significant amounts of uncertainty. Larry is also the lead story developer and education consultant for the burrito game. Dr. Larry's, uh, Dr. Larry Snyder is going to be guiding us through the burrito optimization game and how it can be used as an educational tool. If you missed the game launch during Groby Days Digital in May, this webinar is going to be a great opportunity to learn more about our free game. The game introduces players to the power of optimization, and you're going to learn about how you can utilize the supplementary resources to introduce others to mathematical optimization as well. Thank you, Larry, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thanks so much, Lindsay. I hope everybody can hear me okay. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, so today's talk is about this burrito optimization game that um, Garobi and I developed in, in collaboration over the past year or so. Um, this is a direction that my career, I was not expecting my career to take. Um, I, as Lindsay mentioned, I'm a professor in industrial engineering, so I have my roots in optimization, especially applied to supply chains. Um, but um, I've done several things in, in the past few years involving games, and um, the one that has definitely been the most fun and that I'm the most proud of is this burrito optimization game. So I'm excited to be here today to talk to you more about it. So the burrito game is um, completely free. You need a Groby login to use it, but that's also free. And the purpose of the game is really for education. And so today we're gonna be talking about how to use the game in an education context. Um, that can mean if you're a professor or a teacher and you're teaching a class, or if you're in a corporate environment doing some training, or even just in a more informal setting where you're trying to convey to one or two people certain ideas about optimization. So in today's talk, we'll talk about um, the whole idea of gaming, gamifying optimization, why we chose to take this approach. I'll walk you through how you play the game and what the main um, highlights are. I'll talk about how to use the game in a teaching context, context and what the main educational goals of it are, and then talk briefly about supplementary resources and uh, move on to Q&A. So first about game, gamifying optimization. Um, you know, this is a project that we began about a year ago. Um, the game itself was made by a team of experts in optimization from Garobi, as well as the Garobi development team and um, a team of front end developers who built this game within some a, a framework that Garobi had already developed for other sorts of demos. Um, it took about six months of development and testing, and we released the, the game officially earlier this year, although we're continuing to roll out updates and we'll have a new update available just in time for informs next month. So let me talk a little bit about the background, like how we got to um, the point where we had where we decided that this is what that this game is how we wanted to um, to proceed. So at around the time. We, I started talking with Garobi about this project. There had been some kind of buzz in the data science community about opening Chipotle restaurants. There were a couple websites and Kaggle type competitions that were looking at using data to decide where the next Chipotle restaurant should be opened. And um, we have nothing against these, these um, projects or that question, 
But from an optimization point of view, the question of which one restaurant to open next is not that interesting. What becomes interesting is when you want to ask which 10 or 20 or 50 restaurants should you open next. And so we were interested in trying to convey that next step in the decision-making process. And also to try to convey to data scientists that there's more to the decision-making that can come after the data science piece. So um, once you have really good data and you've made a really good prediction, there's still a hard decision-making problem that can come next, especially if the question you're asking is a combinatorial one, like where should you open 10 new restaurants? So um, I guess it's not an accident that we, you know, that, that the food item in question in our game is burritos given the origin in, um, in this Chipotle story, but that's sort of where the, where the connection ends. And from there, we were interested in figuring out how can we use a game to convey the basic elements of optimization, not how to formulate a linear program, not how to find a cut for a branch and cut algorithm. This, we're talking about the very, very basics. What does optimization do? Why might you need it? And why is it a better tool to reach for than um, you know, trying to solve a problem like this by hand, let's say? So we had a few intended audiences for this game. As I said, we were looking to um, communicate to data scientists that there's a, a next question, a next problem to solve even after the forecasting and data science part is finished. We like the idea of using this game in intro to OR classes. We've started using it here at Lehigh and other um, universities are using it too as like a almost like a day one exercise to give students a hands-on sense of why you would want to use optimization. And a third audience is really anyone who needs a demonstration that optimization by hand is hard. If you are someone who's in an organization where optimization is not well understood and your manager or someone working with you has the sense that what you do is just sort of common sense and they could figure out a network design just by sketching it out on paper or something like that, this game is a good way to show that like, actually it's not quite that simple. And a last sort of bonus audience is for younger students. Um, my 10 year old loves playing this game and we think that it has, it has some use in a sort of K through 12 setting too, as a way of introducing younger kids to, to optimization or to OR more broadly. So I did have some experience with other games. Um, I worked part-time with OpEx Analytics several years ago. That's where I first met Lindsay. And um, when I was at OpEx, we developed a computerized version of the beer game. If you have ever studied supply chain management, you almost certainly played the beer game in one of your classes. It's a game that tries to demonstrate certain difficulties in managing a supply chain that has multiple nodes in it. Our version of the beer game that we developed at OpEx um, had all the, the, the basic settings that you're used to in the beer game. It also had an AI component. We developed a reinforcement learning algorithm that can basically play the game as one of the players on the team. And so that's part of this um, computerized version as well. I also have to mention that unfortunately the link has died for this game. OpEx, you may know, was bought and then that company was bought again. And the new host um, seems not to be maintaining the game and it's not accessible at the moment. We're working on seeing if we can resuscitate it somehow, but um, for now you can't play the game, but I'm happy to talk to you more about it offline if you're interested. There is a long history of using games to try to teach optimization. There's a game um, developed by Hamilton, the mathematician Hamilton called the Icosian game or Icosian game, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. But his version of the game was basically a bunch of holes um, on a flat surface. And you put, your, you put pegs in the holes in order to choose the order that you're gonna visit the holes. It's basically solving the traveling salesperson problem. And the pegs indicate the sequence of nodes that the route visits and the total length of the route connecting your pegs in order is your score for the game. A subsequent version of that same game um, has a, sort of a hemisphere and the pegs that you're trying to visit, the nodes you're trying to visit are on that hemisphere and you have a string that you wrap around the pegs and you try to use the shortest amount of string possible to visit all the nodes. So again, like a really um, tactile and visual way of demonstrating the, the traveling salesperson problem. 
There's also the famous CAR 54 contest that Procter and Gamble ran in the 1960s, where um, this was co-branded with the old TV show CAR 54. And um, the contestants for this contest were meant to find the shortest route that visits all of the 33 cities that are on the map that's pictured here. And the winners, you know, the people who had the shortest routes um, would, would earn cash prizes. And this, this um, game, this competition has an important role in the history of TSP, um, which I learned about through, through Bill Cook's amazing book on TSP, and maybe you've learned about it the same way. Um, but anyway, you know, the winning entry, entry to this competition did find the optimal route through those 33 cities, but it wouldn't be until several years later that anyone proved that that was the optimal route. In other words, that was the shortest known route, but a proof of optimality was, wasn't available for, for years after that as both the software for solving TSP and the hardware that it was run on um, may, were developed. There are more recent um, apps and games that do TSP kind of stuff. So if you've seen Bill Cook's Concord TSP app for iPhone and iPad, it will give you random points and you use your finger on the iPad to sketch out what you think is the shortest route, the shortest um, circuit going through those points, and it tells you how far away from optimal you were. There's another version of the TSP game that has more of like a old school arcade kind of flavor. You can see that TSP is a popular optimization problem for gamification, which is one reason we tried to go in a different direction for the burrito optimization game. There's also, of course, lots of um, puzzles that get solved with OR, either as like a, you know, mini project in an optimization class, or, as, you know, there used to be a column in um, ORMS Today magazine that, that would have you solve puzzles using, um, using optimization. It's a little bit different there, I think, only because those are usually meant for people who already have a good background in optimization and could, let's say, formulate a mixed integer programming model and solve it with Garobi or in some other way. And the, I, the idea there is how to take what you already know and apply it to, um, to some kind of puzzle. What we were interested in is more, again, from the very beginning, for someone who doesn't know anything about optimization or knows very little, how do you use a game to introduce the main ideas? And just on the topic of puzzles, I'll also put in a little plug for another fun project I worked on when I was with OpEx, which was um, developing these two books of puzzles that um, use all kinds of different things. Some use OR, others use math or probability or logic or computing or even like word puzzles and things like that. And um, if you're interested in, in puzzles, you can check these books out on Amazon. But the other reason I wanted to show these two covers is that the artwork from these books might look familiar to you when you play the burrito game because we had the same illustrator, Hansel Gonzalez, for, um, for the art for both. And, and in my opinion, Hansel's art is what gives the burrito game its, its whole feel. And it, I think it really is um, makes it a lot of fun. Okay, so enough uh, of the preamble, let's talk about playing the game. So in the burrito optimization game, um, you are given a map of a city, a fictional city, and some of the nodes on that map are demand nodes, meaning there are people who are living or working in those buildings and um, want to buy burritos from you. And your job is to decide where to locate burrito trucks, like food trucks, on the map in order to serve those customers. So I'm gonna give you a quick live demo of this. I'm gonna stop my share and toggle over to my browser. Give me one second here. Okay, uh, I'm assuming you can see my browser and if not, then um, Lindsay can tell me and, and I'll fix it. Um, so here's a live um, you know, view of the game. Your goal is to drag these burrito trucks onto the map. And when you do, you can see these little dots that represent customers coming from the demand nodes and walking to your burrito truck. Now, there's a ring. So first of all, the number inside the demand node says like the potential number of customers that you could capture with a burrito truck today. But customers are only willing to walk so far to get to a burrito truck. So the closer you, your truck is to the node, the more demand it captures. 
Right now, I put a truck next to this building. This building, by the way, is called the Analytics Center. And um, the Analytics Center is right next to my truck, which means I'm capturing all 30 of those demands. On the other hand, this guy over here, the Poisson Distribution Fish Market. So there's a lot of nerdy names and I'm gonna brag more about them in a little bit, but um, for now you can just admire Poisson Distribution Fish Market, it's amazing. Um, and, but that one's pretty far from my, from my burrito truck. So I'm not satisfying the, all of the demand there, only maybe 60% of it. I have another truck that I located earlier that's down here. So some of my customers are going there. And then these customers down here, um, some of them aren't really visiting my burrito trucks at all because they're so far away. So I might want to take this truck that I located earlier before, um, before the webinar started. I might want to move it a little bit closer. Maybe I'll drag it over here. Or maybe I feel like, no, I should have it up here and, um, and I should put another one down in the, in the southwest here to capture that demand. And as I'm moving these trucks, I'm observing what's happening to my costs and my profit. So at the bottom, you can see that I'm earning a revenue of 2,410 Garo bucks. That's the little G with the slash through it. That's the symbol for Garo bucks. It's cute, right? Um, but from that revenue, of course, I have to subtract my costs of buying the ingredients for burritos. So that cost is 1,205 Garo bucks. And then I also have a cost for each truck that I locate. So I've located four trucks. They cost 250 Garo bucks each. So I have a cost of 1,000 Garo bucks. That leaves me a total profit of 205. And my goal as I'm, as I'm doing this optimization you know, by hand is to improve my profit. So you can see that putting it here gave me a profit of 205. If I move it a little bit south, I have a profit of 255. So that seems better. So through a process of trial and error or whatever degree of kind of analytical, mathematical thought you care to give it, you locate your trucks. And when you're done, you click on the done button at the bottom and Groby solves the problem optimally in the background. So that little flash and the little gear icon that you might've seen for a split second, that was Groby solving the problem. And what we see here are my solution as well as the optimal solution. So my solution is on the left. My four trucks are located where you can see them and you see the little demand animations. The green circles indicate the amount of demand captured. If I, for buildings where I didn't capture too much demand, the, um, the color changes for those circles. And um, Garobi did a lot better than me. It, it got a total profit of 600, whereas mine was only 255. So it tells me that mine was 58% worse than optimal. And it also tells me that Garobi found its solution in 0.154 seconds. So if I'm happy with my solution, I can, try, I can move on to the next day in the game, or I can try again if I want to do something, um, if I want to play around with the same data set. But I'll move on to the next day, and you can see that on each day of the game, the story changes a little bit. So in day two, it tells me that business is picking up, so now I have more demand points and larger demands at each of those demand points, and I can do the same thing clicking and dragging trucks. I'll just pretend that's my favorite solution, even though that's a pretty bad one, and I'll click done. This one is, is actually not even that much worse than optimal than the previous one was. Um, but anyway, Garobi's solution is here. My solution is here. I just wanted to get on to day three so you can see that the story here is not just about magnitude, but about changes in the costs. So in this case, there's been a disruption in the cheese supply chain. And so instead of my ingredients costing me um, I think 250 per per burrito that I sell. Now they cost me seven Garo bucks per burrito that I sell. And so you would want to think about, okay, is that going to mean I should have more trucks or fewer trucks than I did before? Does that mean I should have, I should be closer to my customers or farther from my customers? What's going to be the impact um, directionally, at least on the optimal solution? Okay, so let me stop sharing the um, live demo of the game. I'll show you a few more screenshots in the slides as we continue to go through the presentation. Okay, so we've seen this. Um, I told you I wanted to brag about the names. We crowdsourced the names of the buildings from 
the amazing nerds, I mean, the amazing um, optimization scientists at Gorobi who came up with the best funny nerdy names for these um, for these buildings. So I'll just show you a few of my favorites. Um, this one is the Gaussian mixture shakes and smoothies stand. This is the LP relaxation spa. We have the multimodal distribution center. That's one of my favorites because it's like multimodal distribution in terms of a probability distribution, but also multimodal refers to logistics and distribution center. And oh, I love it. Okay. And then um, we have the linear regression psychology services and the traveling salesperson agency. Um, Farkas's Lemma Maid, another one of my favorites. Uh, oh, there's more. We have the Jacobians Comedy Club and the Convex Amphitheater and Elastic Net Fishing Supplies. K-fold parking validation is another one of my favorites. Uh, the bin packing post office and so on. So you can um, you can browse these at your leisure when you play the game. Also on the website for the game, there is a list of all the building names and a little explanation for, for what some of the terms mean for those who want to learn more about like what is the bin packing problem or what does K-fold parking validation mean? Or K-fold validation, I should say. Um, okay, as I said, each day brings a different story, a different kind of wrinkle to the optimization problem. Um, I didn't show you in the game, but in subsequent round, in the sub, in the second round of the game, so the game is divided into two rounds. Each round is five days. So in round two, we introduce the idea of uncertainty, and we visualize the uncertainty and the demands with these kind of error bars. So, for example, at this Farkas's lemonade stand, we have a expected demand of 23, but the demand could be seven lower or seven higher. Um, for those of you who are interested, we model that as a triangular distribution, so it's not uniformly distributed across that range. The, the most likely outcome is 23, and it sort of tapers off um, from there. In some days, the these error bars are symmetric, meaning it could be the equal likelihood of being higher or lower than the expectation. And then in some days, it, the, we introduced the idea of asymmetry in these error bars. So there might be regions of the map where if you get it wrong, you're probably going to have fewer customers than you think. And other regions where if you get it wrong, you're gonna have more customers than you think. So players can think about like, well, I'm gonna wanna be in a region where there's more potential upside and less potential downside, for example. When you play the game normally, um, using this big play the game button on the main screen, you're going to play it the way I've been demonstrating. There's a second way of playing it, though, called championship mode. And that's so that multiple people can compete against each other using the same underlying data and the same underlying um, setup. So we've used that at conferences, like to have a, a running competition of people who are coming to the Garobi booth um, competing against each other to get the highest score. And we've also used it in classes. So um, for example, one of my colleagues at Lehigh had students play the game on their own to understand the mechanics of it and then set up a championship for her class only where the students could compete against each other to, to get the highest score. Um, and when you've finished your game in the in championship mode, it'll show you the the like the leaderboard, the top scores. This is um, uh, you know this code here, Informs Twenty Two, was the code that we used um, for the Informs Analytics conference earlier this year. Okay, if you're wondering what the underlying optimization problem is that is 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 happening behind the scenes in the game. Actually, I shouldn't even really say happening behind the scenes. Um, this, is the, this is the optimization problem Groby solves in that split second when you click done. And it's also the optimization problem that you as the player are trying to solve. You're not thinking about it mathematically usually, but it is an optimization problem and you are solving it. You're just doing it by hand, by trial and error, by common sense. Um, and so, it, it's worth looking at what the optimization problem itself is as a mathematical programming formulation, um, especially if you're teaching a class where you know this is the direction that you're headed. 
So if you're familiar with facility location problems already, you probably have guessed that what this is is very much like a classical facility location problem, and indeed it is. So here's our objective function. We have a set I of customers, a set J of allowable locations for the trucks. So the customers are the, you know, the nodes with the funny names and the allowable truck locations are when you're dragging a truck, you might've noticed that there's some sort of pulsing dots that show you where you're allowed to put the truck. Those are the allowable truck note locations in the set J. For each burrito that we sell, we earn a revenue called R. For each burrito that we sell, we pay an ingredient cost called K. We have a term called alpha ij that is the distance multiplier. So this is what accounts for the fact that customers who are farther away don't want to don't don't buy as many burritos. A node, a demand node that's farther away sends fewer customers to the to the truck. Um, that's captured in this alpha ij term. Di is the demand, the maximum potential demand for that node, and yij is the decision variable that tells us whether or not a uh, truck at location J serves a customer at node I. Then we also have fixed costs for locating trucks. FJ is the fixed cost for one truck and um, XJ is another decision variable, binary variable that tells us whether we locate at node J. In this formulation, I've written F with the subscript J. That means that the truck cost can be different at different nodes. In the game though, it's the same at every node. So this is just a multiplier for how many how many trucks you locate. We, of course, have constraints. The constraints say, first of all, that at most one truck can be located or can serve each customer. Second, that a truck has to be open in order to serve a customer. You have to have located a truck at that location, in other words. And third, integrality constraints. So this is exactly mathematically equivalent to the uncapacitated fixed charge location problem, one of the oldest, most classical facility location problems. It's a little bit different because we have a maximization instead of a minimization. It's a little bit different because we have um, at most one truck per customer instead of requiring everybody to be assigned to a customer, um, but those are relatively superficial changes and the math is, is essentially the same. So I'm showing this formulation to you because I'm guessing that some of you might be interested to see it, but we also think that it's worthwhile to show this. If you're using this in a teaching context where you're trying to teach students how to formulate math programming models, then for sure it feels like a worthwhile exercise to have them develop this on their own or to show it to them and connect it to what they saw in the game. But in my opinion, even if you're showing this to someone who's never seen optimization before and who you're not planning to teach a whole course in optimization to, it seems worthwhile to show this formulation just as a way of saying, look, you know, it feels kind of black box E, it feels maybe kind of scary that there's this thing called mathematical optimization and the solver is doing this thing called branch and bound or whatever it is, something is happening behind the scenes that you don't know. But actually what's really happening here, a way of capturing the entire logic of the burrito game is in this thing, which is not that big, it's not that complicated looking, it has symbols that you've seen in your algebra class, like a summation sign and a subscript and things like that. And um, it's a way of just demystifying a little bit the idea of mathematical optimization for people who, who haven't seen it yet. Um, and the other thing to, to point out after you've shown this formulation is that, okay, it's a facility location problem. It's NP hard for those of you and those in your audience who know what NP hard means, but that doesn't mean we can't solve it, right? Garobi is still solving these problems incredibly quickly. And that's because facility location happens to be one of those NP hard problems that can be solved very efficiently, typically using fairly standard techniques. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how you would use this game in a teaching context. Um, in my opinion, there are three primary learning objectives that I want players to come away from or students in a class to come away from after they play the game. The first is planning doesn't end with forecasting. If you have really great data, that let, can let you make a great decision about certain things, but still leaves open many other important questions like it, Great data can tell you where to locate one Chipotle restaurant, but finding the best 10 locations is another question. 
Second, optimization by hand is hard. You as a player of the game were doing optimization by hand, by trial and error. Um, and maybe you did okay, maybe you didn't. You saw that my solutions were like 30, 40% worse than optimal and that's not great. Um, but when players put more effort into finding good solutions than I did, they can do much better than that. But still, I mean, they're doing that when there are maybe 15 possible places they could put trucks. But what if you have 50 or 500 or 5,000 possible places where you can put trucks? Then it becomes a much harder thing to do by hand. And third, you don't have to do it by hand. Optimization can be done by algorithms. Optimization is a scientific field that's been around for a long time. There's robust software, including Gorobi, its competitor software, and open source software that can solve optimization problems. And um, you don't, you know, if you're at the point where you realize you can't solve it by hand, that doesn't mean it's hopeless for you because there's technology out there to solve these problems for you. Um, so here's like a sample lesson plan. If you were to teach this class in, um, let's say a 45 minute class period, um, here's one way that you could do it. And by the way, on the website for the game, we have this lesson plan as well as some more details and some um, teaching materials that you can use. This is by no means the only way to teach the game, but this is just one idea. So first you introduce the game. What are the goals? You know, maximizing your profit. What are the rules? How do you drag trucks onto the map and so on? And then have students play maybe two or three days of the game. Remember the game is 10 days long. Play a couple just to get a feel for the game and then maybe pause and say, okay, you know, is it going okay for you? Do you have any questions? What was, what's hard so far? What's easy? You know, have you been able to get close to the optimal solution in the two or three days that you've played the game for? And then after that discussion, finish round one, that gets you through day five. And that introduces these new wrinkles and challenges like cheese cost goes up on another day, like it's rainy, so customers don't wanna walk as far and so on. And then another discussion, how did you, when you were solving the problem in the game, how did you make decisions? How did you decide where to locate trucks? And then start to extrapolate from that. What if you had to design an algorithm to solve this problem? How would you take the decision-making that you used in your brain and apply it to, um, you know, and, and try to codify it in an algorithm and think about the, the steps that that algorithm would follow. Then I think there's two, two directions you could go. One is um, play round two. In round two, we introduce uncertainty. So that gives the, student, the players another um, wrinkle to the game and gives you another opportunity to talk about like how does uncertainty change the decision-making process? What does it mean to trade off like upside versus downside uncertainty and so on? Or you could essentially stop playing the game and do a little optimization 101. Talk about solving the problem by enumeration. I'll come back to that in a second. Talk a little bit about what a MIP formulation is or what branch and bound is or whatever aspects of optimization you're trying to introduce in this, um, in this first day. Obviously, I don't mean teach them everything about MIP formulations or branch and bound, but just the very basic ideas. And then another period of discussion to wrap things up. For homework, maybe the students can do a championship mode game and they can comp compete against each other and then of course have burritos for dinner. So let me talk about a few of what I see as like the teachable moments in the game. What are the, what are the kinds of things that you can try to get across in um, having your students play this game? One of them is about trade-offs, right? Students will quickly get the idea that more trucks means more revenue, but it also means more cost to locate those trucks. So there's a trade-off between having lots of trucks and earning lots of revenue, but also having lots of, um, or, or having few trucks and, and earning less revenue. And they're trying to navigate that trade-off. And you can point out that there are lots of ways to navigate that trade-off. For example, in the solution at the top here, I have lots of trucks. I must have put five of them on the map because my truck cost is 1250 and they're 250 each. Um, in the solution in the bottom, I only had two trucks, a truck cost of 500, but they have almost the same total profit, 2090 versus 2010. So there, it's not that there's only one way to earn a good profit. There are sometimes multiple ways that take different approaches in um, positioning themselves on a trade-off curve. 
Second, there's diminishing returns, right? You can open a truck and you get lots of new revenue and open a second truck, you get less revenue compared to the first truck. And as you add more and more trucks, that revenue tends to taper off. This is diminishing returns and you can, you can talk about that as well. Next, that the optimal solution depends on the data. So you can talk about directional changes in the op op optimal solution as the data change. For example, when the cost of cheese goes up, um, how does your optimal solution change? Are you gonna locate more trucks or fewer trucks? Or if it's a rainy day, so customers don't wanna walk as far, are you gonna locate more trucks so that you're closer to the customers? Or are you gonna locate fewer trucks because each individual truck is gonna earn less revenue because fewer customers are coming to it? So those are the kind of directional changes that you can have students try to predict and then play the game to see whether their predictions um, held. Another teachable moment is that solving the problem using a greedy approach may not be optimal. So I think most people when they play the game tend to do something kind of greedy, meaning you find the best location for your first truck and then you leave that truck there and you find the best location for your second truck. And then you leave both of those trucks there and find the location for your third truck and so on. Um, and that approach actually works quite well, but it's not optimal. And um, we know that from you know, facility location theory, those problems can't be solved in a greedy way. Um, but you can also demonstrate that through the game. For example, in this particular data set, this particular day, um, you can, you would find that the best first place to locate a truck is down here in the Southeast. And then the best place for your second truck is up in the Northwest. And then the third truck goes in the South. And then once you've placed that truck number three, it turns out that the next, that it's actually better to move truck number one North a little bit. And you would not have gotten to that solution by following a greedy approach. And then, as I said, I like to talk about how an algorithm might work. So I like to ask students how, how if you were going to formalize your approach into an algorithm, what might it look like? And there are some typical responses that we tend to get. One is like decompose the problem geographically. Let's say divide it into four quadrants. And then each problem is smaller. So you solve that optimally by hand or by some other method. And then you kind of smash all the solutions together. Of course, that approach is not guaranteed to be optimal. And you can talk about why. Another approach is the greedy approach, which we've already talked about. Reasonable, but not optimal. And usually, especially when I'm dealing, when I'm talking with students who are not familiar with optimization at all, someone usually says something like, look, I mean, computers are really fast. Why don't we just have a solution, have a computer try all the possible solutions? So in other words, we'll try a solution where we have a truck here in the Northeast and here in the Southeast and here in the South and here, you know, try these four trucks and then try this different set of trucks and this different set of trucks and this different set of trucks and so on. Oops, sorry. Um, and since computers are really fast, you could just try all of them. And I love it when students say that because it's the trap that I was hoping they would fall into. And that's when I get to talk about like, okay, that approach that you just described is called enumeration, complete enumeration, and you absolutely should not use it. And in order to demonstrate that, I say, okay, how, if, if you were to do this, how many solutions do you think a computer could evaluate per second? Your computer is going to evaluate all the solutions, all the possible solutions. How many could it do per second? And especially with younger students, someone will say something like a thousand. And I'll say like, no, come on, it's more than a thousand, a million. And I'll say, okay, let's say we can evaluate a billion solutions per second, which we probably can actually. Um, how long would it take to solve this problem using enumeration? And then I give a table like this. Okay, so if there's 10 nodes, 10 possible places where you can put trucks, that means that there's two to the 10th, and there's another little teachable moment reminding them or teaching them why it's two to the 10th possible solutions, um, two to the 10th or 1,024 possible solutions. And if you can evaluate a billion per second, then it'll take 0. 0.000001 seconds. What can you do in that amount of time? Fine, nothing. If there's 20 nodes, there's a million solutions, it takes a thousandth of a second, that's about the amount of time it would take you to like start to blink. 
And so, at, so far, students are like, yeah, this seems fine. Let's do this. I like this approach. Okay, so with 30 nodes, there's like a billion solutions. It takes about a second. That's how long it takes you to smile. 35 nodes, there's 35 billion solutions. That'll take about 35 seconds where I can listen to about one third of Baby Shark, which I would, of course, never want to do for 30, my, if I had 35 seconds at my disposal. But anyway, um, and at this point, people start to realize like, oh, wait, this is actually getting like the times are getting longer more quickly than I was expecting. So then I continue and say like, okay, if there's 40 nodes, there's a trillion solutions. It takes 18 minutes. You could watch like one episode of The Office or most of it. If there's 45 nodes, there's 35 trillion solutions. It takes 10 hours. You could watch the first two and a half Lord of the Rings movies. If there's 50, 55, 60, 80 possible places to locate trucks, we're looking at years, thousands of years, millions of years. And that is not an amount of time that we want to wait just to solve this problem. And by the way, 80 potential locations is tiny for a real world problem, right? Companies solve problems with hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of nodes. And we definitely would not want to wait the amount of time that this would require. And, you know, so if you formulate it as a MIP and solve it with a solver, it will solve in seconds, maybe minutes, if you have like tens of thousands of nodes. Um, so that again, just reinforces the way that you are, the way, the knee jerk way that you think you want to solve this problem is not the way to do it. But that doesn't mean all hope is lost because there is good technology out there to do it. Okay, um, finally, we have teachable moments about uncertainty. Uncertainty makes the optimization problem harder. Um, in the game, we, we demonstrate both the predicted and actual demands on the days when it was random. So when you're solving it, you only have access to the predicted demands and those error bars. But when it evaluates your solution, it evaluates it based on actuals. And so these um, two concentric circles indicate the, the predicted and actual demands. And by the way, your solution and Garobi's are both evaluated based on ac actuals as a, you know, to, to keep, uh, to keep the, the comparison fair. And that the bias in the forecast also changes how you might approach it. If there's a region where you have more upside risk versus downside risk, that might be where you choose to locate. Another, as I said before, another teachable moment is just showing them what a MIP formulation looks like, maybe going a little bit into branch and bound. It's a sort of divide and conquer approach, no details, but just, you know, a, a picture or two that demonstrates conceptually a little bit about what's happening there. One of my favorite um, features of the game are tips that the game gives to the player. So when you play the game and you see your solution versus Garobi's solution, the the um, game displays these little light bulb icons. And when you hover your mouse over, over one of the light bulbs, it gives you a tip. So for example, this tip is saying, oh, you know, this was okay in a deterministic setting, but what if there was randomness? Or this tip says, oh, this is a, this is a great truck. And other tips, um, you know, this tip is just trying to give you a little hint about what an algorithm might do. And other tips would say things about, um, this was a good truck location, but not great. If you had moved it a little, it would be better. Or here's a part of the city that was underserved and it would be good to have a truck in that location as a way of both helping the player in future rounds of the game, but also helping to build more intuition about optimization and how it works. Okay, so how you can use the game in your classes or, or other settings. First of all, you can create your own championship mode for your class. Um, we have instructions here, which I won't go through in detail, um, but they're on the slides, which um, I believe will be distributed after the webinar. And they're also on the website, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but you just basically create your own unique match code. You tell your students to use that match code when they play the game, and then everyone will be competing against each other. There is a way to access the scores during the gameplay so that you can sort of show it as it's happening and give students incentive to, to do better. Um, and then you can also view the results or download them to like a, a, a CSV or spreadsheet file afterwards. 
We have both a teaching guide and a game guide on the website. The game guide is sort of like a, a user's manual for playing, the, for playing the game. And the teaching guide is more about um, how to use it to teach. It contains a lot of the things that I talked about in this webinar. Um, here's just a screenshot from, from one of those websites. Um, and that's all I have. I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Lindsay for a few final announcements. And then we will um, open it up for Q&A. Thanks so much, Larry. Uh, we will have Q&A in just a few minutes, as Larry said. But before we do that, I wanted to very quickly talk a bit about our academic program. The program's mission at Garobi is to help democratize the knowledge of mathematical optimization. And we're doing that through creating new and innovative and applied optimization resources. The game that we're covering today is just one of the multiple tools we've released this year to help new learners. Next slide, please. Okay, so I also wanted to let all the attendees today know about some special free opportunities available for the academic community. So first, we've always been big supporters of academia here at Garobi, and we're continuing to develop new resources to support the academic community and especially new learners. I want to introduce a few ways that members of this community can benefit from Garobi at no cost. First, and probably most importantly, a lot of you may already know this, but Groby licenses are always free for academics and for recent graduates alike. So if you visit our website, you can register and get started with your free license if you haven't already. Second, our optimization experts are available to support students and faculty in the classroom. We do this through guest lectures and workshop opportunities. If you're interested in exploring this as a faculty member, please reach out to me at academicprogram.groby.com. And finally, we want to spread the word about the innovative projects that you're working on with Garobi. If you have an example or an exciting use case that you want to share with the whole community, you can apply to speak at one of our events, to post it on our website, or even join us here as a guest for this webinar series in the future. These are just a couple of the ways that Garobi is working to support the academic community. But I also wanted to note that we've got an active community page on our website where you can interact with other users, ask questions if you're stuck with a particular feature or have a question about your model or have a direct line to other expert users, including members of Garobi's expert team. So you can think of this page as Garobi's own stack overflow. Uh, please visit the community page if that sounds interesting and appealing to you to get started connecting with other users. And you can do that by visiting support.garobi.com and clicking on community. So now we have time for some questions with Larry. Uh, again, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A feature. I already see a whole bunch of questions trickling in and we're gonna try our best to respond to everyone today. I've already answered a few and you can see those answers posted, but we're gonna switch to live now. So Larry, can you see the Q&A? I can, I'm really Beautiful. excited by these questions because they're awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna um, just so, sort of go in the order that I'm seeing them uh, on my screen, which might be different from the order they were submitted, I'm not sure, but um, okay. So one question is about how you would use the game to teach a complete novice in optimization. At what stage should they be introduced to the game? I think you can do it in a number of ways. Um, so, I think you could use it for someone who literally has never even heard the word optimization, like a student in a K through 12 setting or you know, a freshman in college. Um, you could also use it later in the semester when someone has already learned some of the basics of optimization. In fact, we are currently um, running a study at Lehigh and another university where we're testing both of those approaches. And we're gonna be writing a paper um, that will, you know, you know how academic papers work. It takes a while, but when it's available, we'll post a link um, in the in the burrito game um, resources online. In any case, the study is using the game to um, introduce optimization to freshmen who are taking the kind of basic intro to engineering class at Lehigh, where they have not yet specialized in a discipline within engineering and they don't know anything about mathematical optimization, and it'll be probably the first time they've been introduced to any of these concepts. And then we're also using it about halfway through an intro to OR class where students have already seen the basics of optimization. They've started even learning about the simplex method and things like that. And for those students, the idea is gonna to be to use the game more to try to get across some of the um, insights that I talked about in this presentation, like trade-offs or what is the effect of uncertainty and so on. Um, so 
you know, we'll have results from this experiment um, in, our, in the paper that we write. But, you know, just for now, I would say, I hope that the game can be used in any of those situations, um, you know, as the, as the instructor as prefers. Um, there's some questions about why the revenue and the ingredient cost depend on the distance. The revenue and the ingredient cost do not depend on the distance, but the demand does. So the farther the truck is from the demand node, the fewer customers go to that um, go to that truck from that demand node. And so that that means less revenue and less ingredient cost because you're selling fewer burritos, at least for the for the customers at that node. Um, let's see. So uh, someone asked a question about whether the game was devised to explore forecasting skills. And the short answer is no. So remember that at least in part, we developed the game as a next step for data scientists who already presumably know lots about forecasting. Um, and so we wanted to use it as a way of saying, if you've already done that piece of it, what happens next as far as decision-making? So, um, so we're not expecting students to, we're not expecting players to have a model for forecasting in their mind or to have any kind of rigorous approach to their forecasting. We're only trying to make the forecasting, the uncertainty part of the game so that, um, so that they start to think about what it would mean to have a, an optimization problem where some of the parameters are uncertain or what, how, what kind of data, what kind of probabilistic data would I want to have in order to try to make these decisions given that things are uncertain? Um, okay, and then several questions, I should have mentioned this in the presentation itself, several questions about what is available to you as an instructor or as a player of the game in terms of the formulation and the data. So the formulation that I showed you in the slides is available on the website. There is also, I think I'm right. If not, we should definitely do this. I believe there's also Python code that implements the formulation and solves it using Gorobi Pi, which is Gorobi's um, Python package. And finally, I should have mentioned that in every day and round of the game, there's a button to download the data. And that downloads several CSV files that give all the data for the game. Where are the demands? What are the demand values? Where are the potential truck locations? Um, what are the distances among all the nodes? What are the costs? And so on. And so that's all the data you need in order to solve the problem. And we have definitely had professors who use the game to just sort of introduce optimization and then have the students um, formulate the model, take the real data, solve it, and you know double check that the solution that that the game is displaying as optimal really is, but also to compare your own kind of trial and error solution to. Um, so there's a question that refers about that that refers to an API. And I'll just say there isn't an API to the game, but there is this ability to download the, the data. Um, and there's a question about the model in the uncertainty case. So um, okay, so you can think of the underlying problem as a stochastic problem where you are trying to maximize your expected revenue under some scenarios. So I told you we use a triangular distribution, but it's all integers, so you could think of that as like a discrete set of scenarios. And of course, there's an exponentially large number of scenarios because for each node, there's a, there's a probability distribution and they're independent. On the other hand, because of the way the formulation works, maximizing the expected value of the objective function is the same as maximizing the objective function where maximizing the deterministic objective function where all of the random variables are replaced by their expected values. So in other words, to solve the stochastic version of the game is equivalent to a deterministic version of the game. And so that makes the optimization problem much, much easier. But it's it doesn't water down, in my opinion, the questions that you might ask your students to explore about the impact of uncertainty. Including, for example, like this, the way this game is set up, everything's based on expectation. What if you cared about worst case scenarios? What if you cared about other types of robustness, for example? Um, 
Okay, is there a way to incorporate special constraints to the game? No. So because there's no API or any um, any way to interact with the what the game is doing when it solves it, you can't do that, unfortunately. However, because you can formulate it on your own, you could, of course, incorporate those special constraints, side constraints in, um, in your formulation. Um, can I explain how the time increases by two to the n as the number of nodes increases? So it's not that the runtime for Gorobi increases as two to the n, it's that the number of feasible solutions increases as two to the n, because if you have n possible places to locate a truck, each one of them is a yes, no. Either I locate a truck there or I don't. So that's two possible solutions for the first node times two for the second times two for the third and so on. You have n nodes, so it's two to the nth. This is not anything about optimization. It's really only a, a counting problem, a combinatorial um, problem. Um, okay, sorry, I'm scanning as I talk here. Um, yeah, so there's a question about the development of the game and advice and lessons learned in developing it. So, for example, how did you find the right de degree of complexity for the different layers, levels of players you're targeting? I mean, that's a great question, and I don't have a great answer to it. We did a lot, a lot of discuss discussing about it, and the people who were discussing it were um, people who were experts in optimization, me, folks at Garobi, people who are experts in education, like Lindsay, people who are experts in user interfaces for games, like the development team that we were working with, um, and just trying to come up with a good balance. And, and balance is the right word there. We were thinking about that all the time. I'm sure we did not always get it right. And I'm sure that for certain audiences, the balance might be a little bit off but we were always thinking about that balance. Um, another thing I would say about lessons learned in developing the game is just the importance of working with a software development team that has its ducks in a row and has experience doing this kind of thing. Um, both the, the developers at Garobi and the external developers that we worked with um, know what they're doing and know how to manage a project like this. And um, that was a, a, a big improvement on other compared to other projects I've worked on in the past. And I, I think that shows in the in the finished product as well. Um, okay, so there's a question here about how in the game decisions are made by the players regarding the variables. In the question, the, the person wrote XIJ. I think you mean YIJ as I've formulated it. Those are the assignment variables. So um, Okay, so in the formulation, there's two sets of decision variables. Where do you locate and how do you assign customers to trucks? The player of the game only chooses the location variables where you choose to drop the trucks. The game itself then assigns everybody, all the demands to their nearest nodes, which is the optimal way to assign them. So um, there's no capacities or anything of these trucks, which means that it's always optimal for every customer to go to its nearest truck, and that's how the game assigns it but that's not something the player has to do manually. Um, lesson plan and slides are available now, I think, Lindsay, is that right? So we are actually going to be posting the slides just in time for the next update, which I included in the answers. So check back at the URL, which is www.burritooptimizationgame.com in mid-October. Okay, just and that's for, forms. And that's slides for, um, that you could use in your classes, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. And the slides and, for today's session will be emailed out to all registrants and attendees within the week. OK. Um, and then the last question I see is, did you compare the results with other algorithms? No, we did not. Um, because to some extent, we're not trying to argue that one approach for solving this underlying optimization problem is the best approach. We're trying to make a comparison between solving it by hand and um, solving it using an optimization algorithm. And pretty much whatever algorithm you use is gonna beat solving it by hand, at least as the problem size gets bigger. So we weren't too interested in comparing, let's say, solving it with an off the shelf, um, you know, with a, with a MIP solver versus solving it using Lagrangian relaxation or Bender's decomposition or some other way that facility location problems get solved. Part of that is because this problem can be solved so quickly without needing any kind of 
um, specialized algorithms. And partly, as I said, because it's not quite the comparison that we were aiming for in the game. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Larry, for today's session. It was informative, and I hope people play the game to follow. Also, a huge thank you to all the folks who helped develop this game and to all the instructors and students who are already using the game in the classroom and to learn optimization.